Welcome to Constellations, the podcast from Kratos, where industry leaders share their thoughts and experience on the future of space business, policy, and opportunity. If you like Constellations, please support us by giving a rating and review on iTunes. And don't forget to share this podcast online to help our community grow. Welcome to Constellations, the podcast from Kratos. My name is John Gilroy, and I'll be your moderator. Today, we're going to talk about a fairly young venture capital firm investing in dual-use space startups beyond launch. With me today is Jordan Noon, co-founder of Embedded Ventures. Jordan, how's the weather in Los Angeles today? Oh, it's, uh, it's very good today. Uh, it's always good, here. you know? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's a kind of typical LA type day. Well, uh, let's jump right into it. Uh, you know, your business model involves venture capital investing in technology. So when it comes to space technology, what are the most sought after technologies and why? That's a, that's a great question. And as a VC firm, you know, we're looking for space technology and our, our word for it is beyond launch. And and when we say beyond launch, there's been this amazing uptick. I, I rode the wave of it as a startup founder, as a um, early employee in the space industry, working on commercial rocket launch. And, you know, 20 years ago, commercial rocket launch would be perceived as a joke. You know, anyone working on it had either failed or was laughed kind of out of the room. And fast forward to where we are now, you know, there's a commercial rocket launch every day. There's almost a commercial rocket landing. It's going to be every day here. And that's the future that I don't think anyone, you know, very few people would have predicted 20 years ago. So when we say beyond launch, it's really looking at what's going to be the highlight in the news in 10 years, in 20 years, where rockets launching and landing is boring. It's kind of weird to think about that. You know, I I used to watch SpaceX webcasts every day. Every time a rocket was going up, I'd watch them. And now it's kind of like it's just another day. Um, On the East Coast here, I know reporters from the Washington Post who'd go do it in Florida just to see a launch. mm -hmm. It was like a life thing, once in a lifetime to do it. You hit the nail on the head. It's like, oh, yeah. (laughs) <laughs> Another yeah, and, it, and it's changed so much, uh, you know, and of course, launch costs have came down that to your question, as far as what's the most exciting for us, it's pretty broad. It's things that come after rocket launch. You know, what happens in space that's enabled as costs come down? What have people tried before and have failed because it was too expensive that could use a revigoration? It's a very exciting future, some commercial, some defense, you know, some in between where we see, you know, sectors, some of which have been tried, some of which are getting reinvented and some of which um, have never existed before, you know, being enabled by that rapid drop in rocket launch costs. Now, I'm, uh, I'm looking at the last 20 years of the space industry. And I think about the advice I gave my daughter when she had my grandson. I said, you know, the days go by slow, but the years go by fast. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And so 20 years, it's like, I can remember 20 years ago, but wow, all of a sudden, commercial space launches aren't big news. And and there's a whole different set of problems now than when you were 17 years old at USC trying to launch that first rocket, aren't there? No, it's it's very different. And even, um, you know, to talk on my time immediately after college, I went to SpaceX immediately after USC. And I started there in 2014. I was an intern on the in-space propulsion team. So working the propulsion system first for Cargo Dragon, then the pad aboard vehicle to test the abort system for, um, for crew, and then the crew vehicle itself. And in 2014, Falcon 9 was flying uh, once a year or so. You know, we were working on a Dragon qualification for flying on version 1.1, the upgraded Falcon 9 that flew, I think was flight six. And then the first Dragon flight was on flight seven on 1.1. So I, that was my first project as an intern was qualifying the first upgrade of Falcon 9 in 2014. And to think, you know, here we are, uh, it's only, you know, what, eight years later, barely eight years later, um, from when I started at, um, at SpaceX, that, um, you know, there's multiple dragons flying at once, there's crews on the space station, there's civilian crews, there's Falcon 9s flying, you know, more often than we can count and landing, you know, more frequently than we can count. Um, it's only been eight years. It's crazy to think about. So when it comes to startups, uh, mm-hmm. I know you and your, your founding partner have pretty good ESP on a good startup and the bad startups and what to invest in. What are the companies out there now that are doing stuff that are really mind-blowing? There's a lot. There, there's a lot that are doing really interesting things. And when Jenna and I, uh, Jenna's my co-founder here at Embedded, co-founder and co-GP, when we set out with Embedded in 2020, we wanted to build, you know, a, a little bit different of a venture capital fund than we'd seen before. You know, she came uh, before this as a partner from, you know, the hard tech and the deep tech ecosystem here in Los Angeles. And um, myself, I came from being a founder of a, of a space unicorn with Relativity. And but that was my first exposure with Relativity. That was my first exposure to venture capital. 
And, you know, you, you hear about venture capital, you see it, you see all the personalities on Twitter and YouTube as far as them, you know, seemingly to know everything, want to lean into everything, being these like thought leaders in every space possible. And myself as an engineer that had never taken a business class, never taken, you know, a finance class, and but wanted to do these new things, these new kind of groundbreaking things within the space industry. You know, we started going to them to pitch relativity. And all of a sudden you told them about this new kind of company that had never existed before with this technology that had never been applied at the scale that we wanted to develop it. And they wouldn't be interested in even hearing it. Wow. And, and it, was, it was this very confusing thing. And they're like, oh, that doesn't match our thesis. And I was like, I thought that was the point of, of venture is to lean into new areas. Or they'd say, oh, it doesn't pattern match. Or oh, there hasn't been a previous success with that model. You know, we can't do something, you know, that isn't, that's a first of its kind. And it was a very confusing reception. And, and a lot of it is, you know, you know, for a variety of reasons, but venture capital is really tricky at leaning into new areas because they are very strong at pattern matching. And they also tend to not have the technical talent, you know, the regulatory talent, the, the timing talent, you know, when it comes into evaluating the space sector. It's one of the hardest sectors, I'd say, in the world to evaluate on an investment side. Um, because it's so capital intensive, it's so regulated, then, um, you know, some ideas are very difficult to diligence as far as are they real? Are they possible? Is this the right team to build this? Can this team of founders hire people? Can they grow fast enough themselves? And, um, and that's where me and Jenna really started to get to know each other was talking about what we would have wanted to see different, you know, myself at Relativity, herself at her former fund within the venture capital ecosystem. And that led to a multi-year conversation that eventually she asked me if I wanted to come on full-time to a fund that she had started, Embedded Ventures, as an advisor. And then eventually she recruited me to be, you know, full-time as a co-founder in GP. And, um, but to your question on, you know, what would we, you know, what do we evaluate? How do we look at these companies and those sectors? Then it's a reliance on a combination of my background and the technical operation side, having built, you know, a, a space unicorn before. And then herself very much on the people side, right? You're making bets on very young founders. Like for me with Relativity, I was 22, right? When we started, Tim was a couple years older than me. And, um, but it's something that starting that young, you know, they don't have experience, they haven't managed, you know, but are these people to make a once in a lifetime bet on? And that really takes a lot of people, you know, judgment skills that I have learned, you know, step by step, never to doubt Jenna on because she comes from a very stringent recruiting background, startup recruiting background where, you know, her intuition on a people side um, has been stronger than anything. So combine those backgrounds together and, you know, I can elaborate more on it, but combine those together and we have a very unique perspective and a very patient, you know, perspective that we build up on a lot of the companies out there. You know, uh, th I'm in the Washington, D.C. area, you're in L.A. When you said the word regulatory is like, oh, regulatory, <laughs> that's the phrase that pays. And, and, you know, I read your background. I mean, you're 19 years old negotiating with the FAA about sending a rocket into space. I mean, how many people really you run into have that kind of a technical background and a regulatory background? It's really setting you up for exactly what you're doing now. I mean, it was almost like, you know, unintended good background, isn't it? Yeah, no, it's, it was, um, I, I have jokingly said before, you know, I, I winged it, you know, through my aerospace <laughs> degree that um, I even went to aerospace um, originally in college. It was to get, um, it, it was one of the degrees that had the highest likelihood of getting a scholarship, you know, through ROTC, which was my original intent going into college. And, and that was something that for, you know, I, my, uh, again, on happen chance, I had applied ROTC, I'd applied for uh, college degrees that had a high likelihood of ROTC scholarship. I don't come from a background of being able to cover easily, you know, what was especially a USC tuition, you know, even at the time. And, um, and especially too, my, my academics in high school were not strong. You know, I, I struggled very much in a traditional academic environment. And um, one that I was not highly likely to get a strong scholarship going into college. And um, so I went the ROTC route. And uh, the summer before uh, college started, uh, my appendix blew. And oh. very, very aggressive. <laughs> well, not a nice, uh, you know, through the belly button uh, removal. And that was something that I was not in physical condition to enter the ROTC program anymore. Oh. And that happened chance led me to a spot where I had all of this time. And when the USC Rocket Lab came into my intro to aerospace course, you know, I was sitting there, you know, thinking I'd work on planes my whole career. 
never thinking about rockets. And they walk in with this, you know, 12 foot long carbon fiber, beautiful rocket that had flown, you know, three times. That one was a, a super early one of theirs. It only flown to like 20,000 feet. But they're saying how they wanted to be this first student group to fly a rocket to space. And my, my inner rebellion, the part of me that doesn't like structure, doesn't like other people's goals, and doesn't like the traditional kind of academic environment, but what I struggled with in, in high school and earlier than that, I got super excited by this opportunity of self-set goals this program that was out of the supervision of the normal curriculum. And we were going to do something, try to do something super exciting. And, and I ended up taking over that group um, as a junior and, and leading it for two years and trying to be the first student group to fly a rocket to space. And that was an amazing, uh, am amazing start to what's been my career so far. You know, Jordan, you've mentioned your interest in investing in hard tech. So what does that mean to you? What kind of hard tech are you investing in as, as it relates to space? Our, our overall thesis we summarize is dual use space technology beyond launch. And then I'll, I'll break that down. And when we talk about dual use, that's specifically technology that has applications both in the commercial sector and in the government sector. You know, we find not only in the space sector to be essentially impossible to not uh, work with both ecosystems, and, but also something that is people that are very, you know, proud of this country, very proud of the innovation, you know, even we've individually been able to have the liberties to pursue. And, you know, the flexibility and freedoms of this country, my entire career is built on that. Then we find that that's something that um, us as investors, we have obligation to help build that up. You know, the national security community is sometimes and awkwardly now viewed as taboo for the investment sector. And that's something that, unfortunately, I think forgets or that sector forgets that Silicon Valley was built on national security innovation during the Cold War. And that's something that I think is going to be very damaging for the country as we continue to grow. If that's that perspective grows or continues at its current strength. Um, the other parts of the thesis on the space tech, I think that side's pretty obvious. And we've talked about that. Um, beyond launch is really technology moving beyond rockets. It's what happens next. There's enough investment happening today in the rocket sector that we don't have to add into that, right? You see mainstream investors moving into rockets, but you don't see mainstream investors moving beyond rockets. And that's really what we need to inspire if we're going to see both the technological success, but also a national security success as you move beyond um, commercial rocket launch is the primary investment focus. National security and government. Well, I've got to move into uh, some of the areas here that are popular in the Washington, D.C. area, you know. Uh, recently, uh, your mm -hmm. company has signed a cooperative research and development agreement with the U.S. Space Force's SpaceWorks organization. And as a VC firm, what attracted you to develop a relationship with the U.S. Space Force? That's a great question. And part of it is, you know, the dual use thesis, which predated that agreement. You know, the dual use side, when you're, when you're operating in space, you can't be lacking a government relationship, whether it's contractual growth, the regulatory side, you're working with your government or, you know, foreign government significantly as you grow your company. And there's just a significant government presence in space. And in some of those sectors, as well as we talk about the difficulty of investing and especially investment timing in our sector, we see many areas that are at a tipping point of commercialization. I'd use rocket launch as an example with um, NASA, with commercial crew, commercial cargo, right? If you think of the commercial rocket launch sector and even the success of SpaceX, if it wasn't for NASA commercial crew, NASA commercial cargo, that program, that investment from the government was a, you know, when it ended up being a one-time program, an extended program, then but a one-off program that ended up tipping the entire commercial rocket launch industry into self-sufficiency, right? If NASA and VOD was not a customer today of the commercial rocket launch sector, the commercial rocket launch se sector would still be successful. And that's an example that I think is not highlighted enough within the U.S. government circles where it shows the power of tipping an industry into long-term commercial success. And there's other areas in space, there's other areas with national security need right now that I think could turn into a commercially viable ecosystem with the right sort of influence from the U.S. government. And that's really where we see the role of government in these sectors is tipping them to long-term commercial success, where the government doesn't need to continue spending every year into them. They may still, but they don't need to in order to see continued viability. Um, pursuing that, especially with SpaceWorks and hand-in-hand -hand with a Credo where there's no financial relationship 
the intent is really opening the door of how do the moves that the government makes influence private capital? How do the moves that private capital makes influence the government decisions? Because we work hand in hand in a way that is often chicken and egg in an unfortunate way. You know, the commercial investors are waiting for there to be, you know, a bucket of money that means there'll be a future contract that gives just that glimmer of what is the right company to build in a sector that could hit the pot of gold in five years. And that's how the venture investors are making their bets of who could become that moonshot in five years. But no one's going to appropriate that bucket of money until there's enough commercial traction and success that shows that this is going to be a worthwhile effort. But no one's funding those companies until there's money and signs of indication. So the balance between those is very slow and the crater opens the door between those. Jordan, thousands of people from all over the world have listened to this podcast. Go to Google and type in Constellations Podcast to get to our show notes page. Here, you can get transcripts for all 100 plus interviews. Also, you can sign up for free email notifications for future episodes. Now, what is really fascinating is that, you know, inside the Beltway here, I mean, we have in QTEL. I mean, we have SBARs and SCTRs. I mean, we have vehicles for public-private partnerships mm-hmm. here. But the Space Force is looking at this guy in Los Angeles who's got this track record of, of really understanding what that technology is all about and, and partnering with you. I think it's, it's, a, it's a great story to tell. I think more people in town should understand exactly what you're doing. What you're, in fact, doing is you're telling them which horse to bet on <laughs> due to the experience you've had there. I mean, that's, it's really what you're doing. You're saving the government money. That, that is really the intent from a couple of perspectives. And, you know, Jenna was the one that originally brainstormed the idea behind the CRETA. You know, the, the CRETA, the Collaborative R&D Agreement, was something that we, we originated because we wanted to have that open door relationship where we can talk to them and tell them things we're seeing. Or if they're launching a program, whether it's the, the CIBRs, the STTRs, you know, the variety of programs that all of the government innovation entities, AFWorks, SoftWorks, the Jake, you know, um, SpaceWorks now, there's a ton of them. They're launching these programs. And the question we ask is, what if these programs miss the mark? What if the appropriators that have enabled these programs enabled the spend? Do we have time for a couple cycles of practicing on innovation entities? Those cycles can take 10 to 15 years to reset after issues. You, you see that with, um, with InQtel. You, you see InQtel that went through ebbs and flows of congressional backlash. And, and it takes 10 years to overcome that. And that's something we asked SpaceWorks. Do we have 10 years to practice on working with the innovation community? And, and I would say no, or there's a decent, a chan- decent chance enough that we don't have 10 years to practice getting innovation into national security, that we have to hit the mark right. And we can't risk you know, congressional oversight looking at these programs and saying, hey, did you get venture follow on? Did this $25 million you know, TACFI, STRATFI, all of these different forms of entities that are making very good progress, if they're not perfect, there's an Achilles heel for the entire strength of the national security ecosystem getting shored up by innovation from startups. And that's too much risk for the country to take without, you know, for at least us leaning in and seeing how we can help. What's fascinating is the innovation is, is uh, from Jenna's brother, who's in the military, and she sincerely mm-hmm. wants to improve his situation and all his colleagues' situation. And uh, it's just bringing a, a fresh look to innovation and satellites and space for the federal government and many different perspectives. Let's talk a little bit more about this relationship thing here. Yeah. You know, obviously, you and your partner have had conversations with the DOD of how startups can develop better relationships. So even, even the guys around the Beltway, the large primes, are having difficulty with this DOD relationship. So, so what are you telling the government about how this should work? The perspective that I've used on it is looking at it from a, a global economic policy perspective, right? Zoom out all the way, you know, and the challenge we have in the U.S., and this has been something that's been highlighted over the last, you know, couple decades, and I'd say migrating worse, is, you know, we're competing on a world stage where our competition has direct control of their innovation. And we have to control, or maybe control is the wrong word, we have to incentivize innovation in national security. We have to encourage investment in national security um, through capitalism, right? We're influencing individual decision makers when in other countries, every company is a dual-use tech company. And that's the biggest challenge, which is going to set the stage for the entire century, essentially, is can we, through capitalism, incentivize national security innovation more than the direct control of our competition? And that's the question I ask the White House. That's the question that I ask everyone in D.C., and which is, what are we doing to encourage that? And are we disincentivizing that in various ways? And and it's actually a, a very tricky time politically, 
you know, where space used to be apolitical, national security, you know, more political than than not, then, but at least there was a lean in the right direction, I'd say, as far as the value of innovation there. And now there's such an attitude negatively towards, um, you know, I talk about in- innovation incentives. What's the biggest innovation incentive? It's a tax break. But you say tax break in the current political ecosystem, and you're viewed as um, someone completely against, you know, the values of the administration. And, and that's led to certain, um, I'd say, slips on a national security incentivization side for the commercial ecosystem, where you can get a target on your back if you're encouraging innovation through economic policy. Which, which really, it seems that you want venture capital to play a bigger part in shaping this innovation because the venture capital are trying to find the best answers to solutions and you have a perspective on that. I mean, it, it seems like it's a, from a non-political perspective, it's a great answer, but you, we don't talk about the other aspect, but that can make for difficulty, couldn't it? Yeah, it, it's a complicated ecosystem to be um, trying to encouraging that, to encourage that innovation in. And a part of the perspective we have is if you win over the investors, you know, the investors that are not like Jenna, Jenna has her personal tie to it, right? Jenna has her brother on an aircraft carrier in the South China Sea. Right. You know, she understands the global conflict at hand. She feels that personally. Most venture investors do not. They look at their spreadsheets. They look at their returns. You you can see videos of them, you know, on YouTube where they do lectures on how to make money off of the regime change that's happening globally. Right. And I see those videos in horror that, you know, that is the, the lessons being taught on, you know, YouTube, YouTube University is how to make money as the U.S. loses global influence. And it, written by, directed by, narrated by, you know, U.S. billionaires, right? They're like, this is how we made the money in the U.S. And now as the U.S. falls, this is how we're going to make it off of, you know, change in the world. And well, it's, a, it's an interesting abstraction where it's, it's almost scary how disconnected it is. Well, let's lighten up this conversation here and, <laughs> and right. talk about something even more difficult is finding human beings that uh, have capabilities here, you know? I mean, recruiting is pretty difficult in this landscape, especially mm-hmm. for the technical people, you know? So, um, so what techniques are out there to hire and retain the right kind of people in the space sector? And is it that different from, let's say, the cloud computing world than, than the space world? Um, the space world's a little trickier just because it touches so many more areas at once. You know, it's a challenge of the space sector, whether it's hardware, software, regulatory, you know, the economic side of it, everything's at its extreme, right? And that's something that the cloud computing world is is different, right? You know, there's some things that they're extreme, but it's less, significantly less severe, I'd say, in magnitude. So you're looking for even higher top performers, you know, the actual needs of the company, the bets you're making, you know, someone making a mistake in a space company, and that not being caught, then or not having the talent to catch it, that can implode a company years later. Then all of the work, billions of dollars, because of one person's mistake, and and that's something that is very tricky to recruit for. And for us, we're very lucky as a fund. You know, Jenna comes from a tech recruiting background. You know, her original um, foray into the tech industry was going from doing uh, fashion design at Auburn. And she wanted to be a hip hop dancer. She loved fashion. You know, she was doing clothes design, you know, cutout design in AutoCAD. And that was considered a technical skill. It was a knowing AutoCAD. And she ended up getting a job uh, haphazardly, essentially, in Los Angeles um, as a tech recruiter. And that led to a foundation of her recruiting top engineers, first engineers, you know, early executives for startups here in the L.A. tech ecosystem 10 years ago. And when you're making those first recruiting bets on companies, and, um, and those decisions are so impactful. And for her, she was recruiting on contingent equity. If that person left, she wouldn't get the equity. She wouldn't get option grants. Yeah. And so very high impactful decisions. Her intuition there grew very strong. And that ability to not only find talent, but also find founders, make investment decisions on which founders will grow the right teams, which founders will learn the recruiting skills, which founders will get a check, you know, a venture capital check and get confused on what it means to be valued at 50 million by a venture capital investor making a bet versus actually being valued at 50 million. And there's two very different things between a venture capital bet that you may be worth more than that in the future versus actually being valued at that at kind of the inherent level. And that can cause a lot of founders to create personalities, you know, kind of the God complex grows a little too quickly in some in the venture world. And that can implode organizations. We've seen that happen of companies going to zero because, you know, the the founder has uh, 
say some, you know, it kind of goes to their head and then they make some silly mistake. They do something that implodes in public and the company loses confidence. The investors lose confidence. Um, but that's happened more times than you can count where it's an actual personality issue there. I want to go back to your uh, college days. You no doubt studied physics back at USC. I love to quote this physicist guy named Niels Bohr, and you probably know okay. the quote, but the quote is that uh, prediction is very difficult, especially about the future. <laughs> So, Jordan, I'm going to have you make a prediction here and tell me the next five to seven years where you see this whole public-private uh, partnership working and, and maybe some predictions about the space industry. No, that's a great set of questions and a, and a great quote as well. Um, let's start with as far as the space industry as a whole. And, you know, our, our bet is that a rocket launch will be boring, right? That's, that's the biggest thesis for us is that there's going to be all of these new areas. You know, you, you see things like, you know, Virgin Orbit, you know, Blue Origin in the news flying astronauts. Then you see SpaceX in the news every day for, you know, the progress they're making on Starship and Starlink and Falcon 9, then in Dragon, right? But it's something where it's what are the things that are going to be, you know, in the future in five, seven years, and it's not going to be rocket launch, right? You know, people don't realize that SpaceX is a 20 year old company, you know, Blue Origin's a 21 year old yeah. company. Like these efforts have been underway for a long, long time. And they may be mainstream news today. They weren't mainstream news two years ago and barely, I'd say, two years ago. So it tends to creep up as far as the the rate of innovation, the progress and where these companies are going. And I think the areas that will be highlights, you know, five to seven years, it's it's in space manufacturing, it's next generation um, telecom systems. It's what's the future of GPS, right? Is GPS forever going to be a government owned system? There's trillions of dollars of value locked up in that that could be commercial innovation, that same pot of gold. Who's going to win GPS for? Who's going to commercialize, you know, a, a GPS ecosystem? And um, lunar, the lunar ecosystem, I think, you know, for both national security reasons and economic, you know, national security, I think will end up being the driver there. And on an innovation front is, you know, the U.S. is not going to be, uh, not going to fall shy of a moon competition but I don't think they're going to lean in first. You know, they're, they're chasing a little bit right now on a lunar innovation side. Um, but that's going to become more and more relevant, you know, which is going to be the first country that points something down at us from the moon. And that'll be a big scare for, for the U.S. And I hope something that wakes up a greater community onto what other people are trying to do in space. But overall, I think it's going to be a lot of innovation in areas. Again, some are old, like telecoms, new players, new entrants. Some are rapidly being commercialized or attempted to, like GPS and next generation PNT, pointing navigation timing technology. And, um, and then really cool stuff on in-space research, in-space manufacturing, um, in-space uh, tourism. And then a ton of activities that have, are happening in space are going to happen in space at a scale never, never before seen. Well, Jordan, we're running out of time here. You know, we began the conversation talking about unicorns and dragons <laughs> and wound yes. up at the end talking about hard tech, dual use and public private partnerships. It's been a great interview. I'd like to thank our guest, Jordan Noon, co-founder of Embedded Ventures. Thanks, Jordan. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Constellations, the podcast from Kratos. If you like this interview, please subscribe, tell a friend, and give us a review.